as we peer out into the night sky and wonder if there are intelligent minds besides humans on other planets, is it possible that we will elevate other minds here on this planet and lift them up with us to the heavens above? In science fiction we often see encounters between advanced civilizations and those which are more primitive. Sometimes those primitives are modern humans, in the technological sense, and sometimes they are only modern in the biological sense, where we see a visit to a Stone Age civilization. There's a lot of reasons to wonder if such an encounter might end badly for one or more of those parties, even if the more advanced civilization is not hostile to them. But today we'll be considering the case where that civilization seeks to uplift the more primitive one. The term uplifting comes to us from scientist and sci-fi writer David Brin in his 1980 novel Sundiver, the first book of his uplift saga that deals with the ethics and morality of uplifting other species. In that series, every other civilization in the galaxy has some other civilization that was its patron and uplifted it, and humanity is the odd case out in that we arose without any known benefactor and had uplifted a couple of other species native to Earth before encountering any aliens. It's an excellent look at the topic of what that relationship might be like between patron and client species and the conundrums involved, and while we will cover those today, I strongly recommend giving it a read. This also isn't our first look at uplifting on the show, and we covered in our two-parter on uplifting featuring John Michael Godier a few years back. Today I want to zoom in on the ethics of us doing this, but first, let's review the concept and its categories quickly. In the past I've broken uplifting into three major categories, neurological, technological, and biological or physiological, and those remain our big three, but I'm going to add in four more special cases. Cultural uplifting, ecological uplifting, non-Darwinian uplifting, and post-biological uplifting too. We will cover all seven quickly, alphabetically, and with a fictional example, and then move into reasons for uplifting and how you do it, both in terms of the method and if you're raising a species or small group to serve as guardians or ambassadors. Once we flesh out the landscape, we'll contemplate the ethical dilemmas generally, but I'll raise some for each category as we go. Biological or physiological uplifting is the process of altering an existing organism to be better able to use technology, and an example here wouldn't be altering a dolphin to be smarter, but giving it hands to manipulate tools. We often imagine this in conjunction with one or more types of uplifting, but by itself it contemplates altering an already intelligent creature or simply be better able to use technology, and that could be hands for a dolphin or even lungs for intelligent marine life who would then walk onto land and presumably discover fire. It is quite possible that there are a lot of oceanic plants out there where critters kept getting smarter but couldn't discover fire, and indeed grew much smarter than modern humans, so that very quickly after being brought on land they work it out and explode into the galactic scene as super geniuses. This is a case where it is possible to ask the species if they'd like to be uplifted, as their inherent intelligence means they can discuss the probable outcomes. Indeed it's a good one to begin framing our ethics conversation as it not only lets us consider if we should ever do uplifting involuntarily, but if we can assume there are cases where we could meaningfully ask. Also, what the consequences of uplifting a species might be if it's smarter or more fertile or aggressive than we are. Is it appropriate to uplift an animal or alien and reduce its fertility so it no longer breeds dozens of young every year or is less aggressive, and when would such changes start to transition them from being your client species or new friends you mentor into a slave race? Cultural uplifting is perhaps the one we most tend to think of when worrying about concepts like the Star Trek Prime Directive or drawing parallels to our own historical colonial periods. We tend to regard us showing up to visit distant Stone Age cousins on some island as the beginning of a technological uplifting, and this is not the full extent of what tends to happen, nor generally what folks of later generations have complaints about. Technology all by itself absolutely causes social and cultural changes, but mostly later generations are not upset that you gave them metalworking or modern medicine, they are ticked that something has supplanted or even erased their culture and traditions. And yet while it has a decidedly negative connotation these days, I think we still need to consider it a form of uplifting, its ethics notwithstanding, but it is ethics we're focused on today and so we probably need to acknowledge that simply calling cultural uplifting a bad thing, 
or a false form of uplifting is a bit too much of a blanket approach. We might imagine coming across an alien civilization where they still regularly engaged in human sacrifice, or alien sacrifice, as indeed did happen occasionally in our own colonial era, and not many folks think interceding to stop or at least discourage that was wrong. We can make a case we should keep our nose out of it and have no business stopping them, but I would have a hard time saying someone was evil or wrong to go and encourage these aliens to stop. Though as a word of caution, if you find yourself reasoning that all morality is subjective and the aliens engaging in mass alien sacrifice have their own ways and morality, keep in mind that argument is fine except it leaves the same exception for any of us deciding that by our ethics, landing legions of occupying forces to stop them is proper. It is a bit hypocritical not to extend the same card to your own civilization. If it's wrong to tell those aliens to stop murdering their own, then it's also wrong to tell the Klingons to stop invading them or the Ferengi to stop ripping them off, and it's wrong to tell some independent human colony not to do it either, or even our own folks. And strictly speaking, this line of reasoning doesn't have a lot of room for a meaningful definition of right or wrong, or good or evil anyway. It's a bit dubious to say morality is subjective then start condemning any given behavior. That said, I think most of us tend to assume caution and restraint is the course of wisdom in regard to poking your nose into another civilization's business these days, and even on a fairly extreme case like ritual sacrifice, caution is wise. In Orson Scott Card's classic novel, Speaker for the Dead, a human colony finds their ward is already occupied by a primitive but intelligent race, nicknamed the Piggies. When the colonists realize their intelligence, they put a big fence around their settlement and restrict human expansion on their ward beyond there. This is enacted with no complaint from the colonists who are not thieves and have no desire to take that planet from these newfound intelligences, they will remain but not expand. There is debate about contact with the piggies who do want that contact themselves but are very friendly, and there's some limited anthropology, which shows they richly sacrifice some of their own and take guidance from the equivalent of tree spirits. This anthropology is banned after the anthropologist is sacrificed, but his apprentice does it anyway, is met warmly by the piggies, and gets himself sacrificed later too. Tensions rise. That's essentially the intro to the story and it's too good to spoil, though I must partially to make the point. Skip ahead about 60 seconds if you want to avoid that. 3, 2, 1, spoilers. The piggies are not ritualistically butchering themselves because they are primitives who worship bloodthirsty trees. Rather, those trees are sentient and basically they are mature butterfly form. When they die, their organs plant themselves and they grow into a sentient tree. But when properly dissected and planted, they are a lot more likely to turn into wise and talkative father trees. So it is an honor given to their most wise and respected, and they gave it to the two anthropologists. They assume they messed it up the first time when no tree came, and when the protagonist explains to them that we don't turn into wise trees, we just die, they react with utter horror and shame at the realization they murdered innocent humans who were also heroes to them, a heroism mostly obtained by illegally sharing technology with them. That's a good reminder that we rarely see locals being asked about how they feel about the Prime Directive in Star Trek, but we'll return to that in a bit. Ecological uplifting is a broad category and to continue from our fictional example of the piggies from the novel Speaker for the Dead, their improbable seeming biology seems to be the byproduct of a heavy handed example of either terraforming or ecological uplifting by another alien race encountered later in the series. This is also implied in a lot of sci-fi like the Alien franchise in the film Prometheus, where the creation of advanced life comes from aliens seeding Earth with primitive life intended to evolve to intelligence one day. We see the same in the late season Star Trek The Next Generation episode, The Chase, where they hunt around the galaxy for some greater blueprint or message in various alien DNA that they think is going to be the blueprint for some advanced technology, but instead is just a recorded video of a vaguely humanoid alien claiming to be 4 billion years old and from a race that seeded the whole galaxy out of loneliness, and that's why so many of the species in Star Trek are humanoid. Now seeding life that long ago is mostly an example of sci-fi writers having no sense of scale, but we might imagine an alien race finding a galaxy full of life forms with some brains but nothing anywhere near human intelligence and tinkering with their environment to cause that to arise. 
For example, we think predator-prey relationships are the main engine driving the development of intelligence so you could craft a world that distinctively favored intelligence. Plants whose fruit was obtained by patient calculation or grew into hedge mazes, with safety and food in abundance in the center of the labyrinth. This is a very broad category and has no unique ethical issues that come to mind. You are tampering with an entire ecosystem, but that's generally implied in other cases too, with some exceptions. I could also imagine aliens encountering a planet and deciding to build space habitats around it as nature preserves, and those being tinkered with to allow a habitat more of the size of a county than a continent to be comfortably and sustainably self-contained. And you might have several of the same regional ecosystem and have slightly different variables in each, which might cause profoundly different evolutionary paths to be followed. Ecological uplifting can be cases where you encounter a planet with little to no land and engineer some islands or even introduce some parallel to coral or floating trees to make large raft islands. But it also runs hazily into neurological uplifting in purpose if we were to contemplate something like a planetary hive mind or even a regular but sentient mind made of an insect hive, where the insects themselves are no more the organism and mind than our neurons are and their hive is essentially a large computer or brain one that might even find its components rather icky, much as we often find with our own brains and other biology. Neurological uplifting is what's implied in most cases of uplifting in fiction as it means you're taking some already clever animal and rebuilding it much smarter. Your dog or dolphin made smarter. Also worth noting that uplifting does not necessarily mean you made them as smart as you are. Many might be happy with dogs a bit smarter than now, but may not be looking for a species smart enough to have existential dread, or want to move out when it grows up or demand voting rights. Just something smarter than now, though that might result in a gradual improvement, especially as some might feel they were ethically obliged to make their smart dogs smarter and independent. I would say a fair amount of existing intelligence in the organism is implied, as while you might make something intelligent from something mostly or completely without a brain, super intelligent lobster or even a tree, you are in the range where you're not so much rebuilding and upgrading the brains as the entire biology of the creature. Note that this is identical in outcome to if we stick a brain enhancing computer chip in someone's head, but distinct in method, in the sense that you're upgrading the biology. Your mileage may vary on which is more preferable, a chip in your head or a bigger head. We also see head gear that makes someone smarter, as with the dog in Rick and Morty or the chimp in Futurama. Also note that this isn't just intelligence, and we would more broadly include tinkering with behavior as part of this. If critters are fairly small but prone to get anxious or aggressive around each other, you might add some brains but also tweak that instinct so that they are able to form bigger and more functional tribes as a prelude to civilization and this might include options that were not terribly likely to arise by normal evolution. Non-Darwinian uplifting would be examples where you're making some change to an organism's mind or body which we would never expect to evolve naturally, and again this can be something physical or mental and an example of the latter might be a passive species. Generally, nature encourages aggression over passive behavior, but we've bred a lot of our livestock for the latter and it's often suggested a species might be altered to be less aggressive to either curb their warlike tendencies or turn them into a more servile client or slave race. Lowering their fertility rate might be an example too, especially if it's not being done with the intent of allowing the quality over quantity reproduction strategy humans and other large animals with long maturation periods use. This can also include working in strange traits that would be overly specialized so as never to evolve in nature. On the physical side, we get the example of the Gagek from David Brin's Uplift Saga, who in addition to four eye stalks from the top of their body also have wheels and pusher legs. The wheel is a simple device to design, one of the six devices classified as the simple machines along with a level, pulley, inclined plane, wedge, and screw, but while a simple machine and an amazing means of locomotion, it isn't one we would expect to evolve naturally, and the same for the pulley. We might also imagine a species being given a modification to better handle surface radiation so they could move out of sheltered caves by giving them the ability to grow lead skin and not be made sick in the process of eating and processing it. Technological uplifting is giving intelligent aliens technology and is often intertwined with cultural uplifting, but we basically mean it as showing a stone age civilization how to make metals 
or an Iron Age civilization how to make a computer, it is very hard to avoid cultural uplifting by accident, as dropping walking blueprints for a device is likely to still cause those changes, even though you didn't even speak to them. Indeed this is even done intentionally in the novel Life, the Universe, and Everything by Douglas Adams to turn the peaceful people of the planet Cricket into homicidal lunatics by giving them blueprints for a spaceship. It's probably the most debated type of uplifting as it clearly reminds us of some of the less admirable moments in our history, but one that doesn't get raised very often is the conundrum of why it's wrong to give technology to other groups. In sci-fi this is usually a hand wave to allow super powerful aliens to show up in the story, push everyone around rather smugly, then explain that they knew from experience giving technology away was wrong and thus the next episode of the show need not handle the ramifications of all the new technology hitting Earth. I appreciated that in Stargate SG-1 the protagonist often called advanced aliens out for this dubious cop-out. Now those ramifications are very real and very definitely legitimate points of ethical discussion, but I think we are very bad about drawing a line on why it's wrong for an alien to give us technology but not one of our own scientists, or why science or technology is only one person invented and only a tiny portion of our population actually understands is somehow okay for us to use. If an alien who gives us technology shouldn't give their opinions on ethics, then should the same apply to scientists and innovators on Earth? Unsurprisingly as a techno-optimist, I tend to find discussion of civilizations being too primitive to use a given technology safely a bit of an artificial delineation. Why are you or I in any way entitled to technology a given human invented and some alien entitled to the science some other alien invented, and somehow safer to use it? The answer, of course, is that we were raised around it and we have long-term evidence of how it impacts or messes with our civilization or culture already, but that is a very weak argument for not offering it to others. We can also offer them all of your lessons learned and warnings. It is also a slippery slope fallacy in that me showing some tribe how to make iron does not mean I need to show them how to make hydrogen bombs a year later. But sci-fi does give us a lot of reminders how this sort of help can have negative ramifications, that tribe now equipped with iron goes and slaughters its bronze armored neighbors, and we have seen civilizations here on Earth gain weapons technology from outside, like guns, and use it to attack a neighbor, so it's not just an academic or hypothetical scenario only seen in sci-fi. We explored that in more detail in our Prime Directive episode some years back, and the reasoning is familiar to most sci-fi fans. For our purpose though, it is always good to remember that all actions, including inaction, have consequences, and that while uplifting changes a species, all species are constantly in change anyway. Biology is not a static thing. Of course some folks might use post-biological uplifting approaches and this is your brain chip that makes your dog or chimp smarter, again like in Rick and Morty or Futurama, but also you uploading or digitizing your mind to a virtual environment. This also includes a suit a dolphin could wear that gave it feet and hands for land, or cybernetic augmentation that did. I think we tend to assume uplifting would be something genetic, or even psychic, like ascending an individual or an entire race to a higher plane of existence, which we would call psychic uplifting. And this one is out of alphabetical order because it's more of a method than an outcome. You could use cybernetics to mimic biological or neurological uplifting, if psychic powers exist, You could do those that way too I assume. We also have technological options of genetic engineering or cybernetics versus chemical methods, some brain enhancing drug or cocktail, or even simply education. And to stretch that case, you might have an alien that was ultra fast adapting who consumes a bit of DNA and can mimic it or alter its own structure, up to ordering its body to begin growing more neurons and could be taught to advance itself something we often consider for non-biologicals like AI, where we assume AI grows smarter on its own or with our help, and that is a type of uplifting too, I should think. Now why would you uplift a species? Well, fiction and contemplation offers a number of reasons, some more logical than others, though in this case, since we're talking motivations, where logic need not rigorously apply. I might uplift my cat because I'm fond of him and I want him to live longer life extension is arguably uplifting and certainly at least loosely correlated. I don't know that I'd make my cat smarter personally, but I am fond of him because he's quite intelligent compared to most cats I've had. I also heavily anthropomorphize my pets 
but I'm nowhere near as bad about it as some, so I think we can easily imagine folks opting to make their pets smarter simply because they wish them to be, and I have difficulty seeing that getting allowed without objection, or easily banned either. You could end up with a hundred cat subspecies in a few millennia that include those that were baseline cats, baseline in intellect but longer lived, smarter but just enough to work a few simple tailored devices, one of toddler intellect and others of half cat half human form who were nearly as smart as us, and another that was as smart, and everywhere in between and adjacent to those. Only for the smarter ones is there any real need to start thinking of them as no longer in the pet or child role where we need to contemplate them wanting to vote or have their own spaceships and colonies. On the nastier side, you might be uplifting creatures to be smart enough to be servants but no more brains or free will than needed to be menial. We see this a lot in fiction, sometimes it's us uplifting primates to be useful workers as alternatives to robots, sometimes it's a conquest-oriented alien who finds existing races or apex animals on new worlds and tailors them to be useful servants. The Dominion from Star Trek did this with their servants the Vorta and Jem'Hadar, even intentionally building in weaknesses to them for control or leaving out good but non-utilitarian traits from cool indifference to their servants having them. We also see something similar in Malky Cooper's Mokiari Wars, a good military sci-fi that deals with both transhumanism and uplifting, and where we see aliens who have definitely been altered and engineered to a role in a wider multi-species caste society and empire, which is a common theme in sci-fi too. This raises the notion of downshifting, where you might alter a species to be less intelligent and less able to organize rebellions or develop weapons. John Michael Gaudier and I discussed that in our original episode on Uplifting Together, I cannot remember which one of us coined the term downshifting but he presented it as an option for a civilization that was not terribly kind but not prone to genocide. They encounter a primitive race and instead of uplifting those critters, they alter them to be less intelligent or less able to use technology, as an alternative to wiping them out before they become a threat. This could be leaving their brains intact but making them less fertile, or having a high infant mortality rate, like was done to the Krogan in Mass Effect after they were uplifted and employed to fight a war against a hive mind of techno-arachnids, the Rachni, who were themselves uplifted for use as a weapon by another even older race. I loved that game franchise except the last 20 minutes of Game 3, and wish indoctrination theory had turned out to be canon for that game, but I digress. Now we keep talking about uplifting races or even whole planets, but in practice you might simply be uplifting small groups or individuals, and this might be done as a way of creating an ambassador or guardian for a race. An alien might abduct a human, take them off for some enhancement and training, and use them as an ambassador or liaison between worlds. Or even more individually, we might imagine a civilization with mercantile traders running big space freighters between worlds, taking on or hijacking people from a system to serve as their face for negotiations or insights into the locals' minds, and with various augmentation. Or you might decide to protect the world or guide its advancement by recruiting some individuals to be uplifted, and then serve as guardians or guides for that world's development. Or even as a method of atonement like if you accidentally dumped something dangerous there and want to give them long term protection against it. We see something like this in Gary Seven, a character from a backdoor pilot episode of the original Star Trek series who gets a brief mention in the newer Picard series, but is an uplifted human whose ancestors were abducted thousands of years ago by aliens and uplifted to serve as an agent or protector to Earth. There's some interesting and questionable canon background on him that implies the planet his people come from is the same one as the Traveler from the Next Generation came from, Tau Alpha C, and have him interacting with Khan Noonien Singh, and Khan would be an example of self-uplifting, in that it's a race creating a sub-race of its own with superior traits, whereas the Deltas or Epsilons from the classic novel Brave New World, created to be menials, would be an example of self-downshifting. So that's the methods, types, and reasons for uplifting, and I think we managed to get most of the key ethical conundrums covered while discussing them, but let's touch on a few more briefly. As I mentioned near the beginning, most types of uplifting do not really assume any ability for the organism to give informed consent, and many stories have played with the uplifted creature feeling resentful of being uplifted afterwards. And that would seem a big issue with test subjects 
or if you weren't raising groups of uplifted organisms together so they looked or felt like freaks. Giving a dog hands and a bigger head is very likely to make other dogs dislike that dog, too, though as dogs already vary a lot in morphology and are used to living with other species, frequently not just humans but cats, cows, horses, sheep, and more, they might handle it better than most. Then there is the question of if a thing, once given, can be removed. If we uplift some chimpanzees and they turn treacherous and dangerous to us, can we downshift them again, or is altering them or sterilizing tantamount to genocide at that point? Does I brought you into this world, I can take you out of it apply, and for that matter, do you have the right to remove or neutralize your own creations, and do you have a responsibility for them? If some lunatic made a race of aggressive sentient squid and unleashed it on an unsuspecting galaxy where they conquered primitive world after primitive world, do we have a responsibility to track them down and fight them? What if it wasn't a lone lunatic but the past policy of a long gone government, much as slavery was in the past? If someone makes a sentient dog who breeds more sentient dogs, are we required to give them voting rights and citizenship? Should we be integrating them into our society or helping them establish their own, or both? Some might want to fly to space and make their own colonies, some might want to remain here and expect to be able to vote or run for higher office. How do we handle separatist canines, or humans for that matter, who want their own canine-only or human-only colony? What about non-uplifted dogs as pets, or partially uplifted ones that were not human intelligence? Would the canine be right to object to us keeping those as pets, or would they perhaps like keeping them as pets too, or even pay a geneticist to downshift some human DNA to make pet humans? Would it be ethical for one of the uplifted canines to breed with a partially uplifted or baseline dog? What about those who would seek to engineer some werewolves, half human and half uplifted dog, or wolf? Now those all sound pretty disturbing but we should be mindful there are other options too, like the long-lived and slightly smarter cat or dog who is a member of the family for generations. Indeed the nature of medical testing is such that it is likely the first creature with a vastly extended lifespan would be a lab rat, followed by a number of other animals like cats and dogs, long before it got approved for humans. A family pet, smart enough to mostly take care of itself, especially in a fairly automated and post-scarcity civilization, and able to live centuries at the family home is appealing to me, and I think it raises the question of all this might be inevitable. Today we ask about its ethics and it's mostly academic, a matter of sci-fi, but the areas of improving intelligence and lifespan are too critical to humanity's future for us not to experiment with, and it is likely that will involve many and diverse experiments on animals, and we will inevitably trot them out potentially even literally, for all to see the progress, and I have problems imagining bans on early experimentation or anyone ordering the destruction of various celebrity uplifted animals, your Mr. Eds and so on, that the labs bring on talk shows to introduce and humanize and ask for more funding and permissions. And any rule may last a generation or two in a given century, but what about that one country that will flout the rules to attract laboratories and which nobody is willing to invade to make stop? And what about after Earth, out on the many planets and space habitats where we might use tailored intelligent organisms as an alternative to AI? Might we see this develop? Might we see gradual increases in pet intelligence as generations roll by until gradually, in the year 4000 AD, we simply have a number of pets who have hit baseline human intelligence? Even longer term though, as we head out to the stars and need decades for messages to get to the nearest outposts, and longer for responses to arrive, will some colonies abandon those restrictions? What if they are uplifting native terrestrial organisms or experimenting on simple alien life we might find? What would we do about it? To be honest I don't know, my hunch is that uplifting is a Pandora's box technology that will get opened and will ensure the future galaxy is a pretty alien place, even if every life form in it can trace its origins back to modern Earth, and we explore that possibility more in our episode Galactic Humanity, but as we're seeing today, it is very likely that humanity will head out to the galaxy but not alone, that in many ways it won't be humanity colonizing the stars, but Earth and its many children, with us just the spark that ignited the rocket, and time will tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing. 
though I imagine whoever was around then to give an answer will say yes, it was a good thing, albeit the language they use might be a sequence of balks or meows. We were discussing moving species up, down, or even sideways on the evolutionary ladder today, and if that caught your imagination, then let me recommend Cell to Singularity, our free-to-play science-based game that lets you take life from a barren, early Earth era of the most basic life forms to dinosaurs and all the way through to modern animals and humans, then go beyond into our future and out among the stars. Cell to Singularity's designers are also fans of our show, so they take science and futurism seriously while also giving the game a compelling science fiction flavor. Cell to Singularity is easy and free to play on Steam, iOS, and Android, and can fit comfortably into your day whenever you want to see how much entropy you've accumulated in the meantime and do some evolution. The game is accurate, based on real scientific data and research, and just fun to play. Whether you're on your PC or phone, just search Cell to Singularity on Steam, Google Play, or iOS, and start uplifting your new civilization today. As a quick announcement, as we move into the new year, we'll be replacing our last Sunday of the Month livestream with a regular episode, and transitioning towards having 7 episodes a month, one each Thursday, then 2 or 3 probably on Sundays, with maybe 5 or 6 shorts a month too. The shorts remain a bit of an experiment. Technically, so was the live stream, but we ran that experiment for over five years. And if you missed the last one or want to catch any of the 60 live streams we aired over the years, they are still up for replay. We may return to doing something live at some point, and I do live interviews on other folks' shows fairly often too, but I prefer our usual format of taking my time to write and narrate a script. Speaking of experiments, last year I switched away from doing extended editions of episodes on Nebula to short bonus episodes, and before long those became normal length monthly episodes, and I will begin airing them here on YouTube when each turns a year old, after they've been exclusively on Nebula for a year. Those will mostly start hitting this summer, but we have our first one, Conformal Sick Cosmology, coming up on January 28th and in the meantime, we have plenty of other episodes. Starting this weekend with our Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Aliens vs. AI, to see which is the bigger threat and who would win in a conflict between the two. Then next week, we'll look at regulating space, and in two weeks, what Lagrange points are, why they are so valuable, and what settling them might be like. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, isaacalfer.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like Giant Space Monsters at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.